everything is great. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you very much for coming, all of you. Um, I have pauses for questions. Um, in the London meetup where I gave this talk for the first time, uh, there were a lot of people and we couldn't really interact very well because of lag. Uh, here, we've got a Zoom session. So uh, just unmute yourself and ask when it comes time for questions. Um, I, I hope that I'll be able to do the talk a little more justice this time because I was really rushing through it. And plus, uh, Eric Niebler really liked it and he supplied some more material uh, and some more experience that they've had with Tag Invoke using it in uh, LibUnifex uh, at Facebook. Um, yeah, so let's let's start with the talk. Um, and yeah, I, I really want you to like stop me if things are not clear. Uh, your understanding is the whole point. So, all right, tag invoke, an actually good C++ customization point mechanism. Like, what does that even mean? Uh, and that's actually where most of the talk is about. Um, we are going to start with uh, what is the customization point problem? What even are customization points? And so customization points are the answer to the eternal question of how to produce a uniform interface to things that have similar meaning in similar situations so they can be treated uniformly. Or put another way, how do I make these types work with those algorithms? Uh, especially if those things are from different libraries and so on. So this problem turns out it has a number of aspects. And we'll go through them. There's a recap of all of these at the end. So don't like try to remember them too hard. I just want you to know that it's a very multifaceted problem, which is why it's so hard. OK, so the first facet is nouns coming groups. Right. Um, this we have known since the, like Plato. Um, so all cars are kind of the same, but different, but still the same. And what we mean by the fact that they're the same is that all cars support certain basis operations like engage turn signal, except apparently BMWs, as we all know. Um, and cars from the same company can often share the implementation of engage turn signal, but fundamentally, it's a basis function. Cars have a bunch of basis functions, like turn steering wheel, and you know start and stop, and so on. Uh, and all of those need to be implemented specific to the car. But as far as the user is concerned of the car, cars drive pretty much the same. Um, this is what we call the specialization problem, which is providing the basis operations under the same name. The second aspect is that not all verbs apply to everything. So in order to be used by algorithms that operate on card, you kind of need to be a card. Like you need to support engage turn signal and all of the other basis operations that we require from card. Uh, and whether you support those, detecting that in a sort of reflection -y way, uh, that's the detection problem. And the reason we need to solve the detection problem for the customization point problem is because we need to dispatch to the correct implementation. And unless you know what your what basis operations the type provides, you cannot dispatch before you error, right? So that's why uh, like Sfine and all of these other things are used. Um, there's another aspect, which is verbs are composed of other verbs. And this is very coupled with the detection problem. So let's say we have this uh, function charge, uh, and we want to charge a thing from a supply. And usually, we should be able to do it kind of like we connect the, thing, uh, the thing's charge socket to supply, and then we charge while uh, the thing is not full and the supply is not empty. Like, and that should, in theory, cover most 
uh, chargeable things. Of course, chargeable things in order to use this algorithm need to support the charge socket operation and empty, uh, sorry, supply needs to support empty and our thing needs to support full. Um, and connection needs to supply uh, support charge while. So all of these things need to exist. And if those things exist, then we can use this charge default algorithm. And it works really well for all of these cases like let's say we've got a lada we can charge it from a petrol can if we want to charge a phone you can we can take a usb cable and like charge it right um if we have a tesla we can charge it from a light pole however um if you look at the code snippet below if we have a tesla supercharger and we want to charge a tesla we might have a slightly more specialized algorithm already because these two things are specifically made to work with one another and not just, you know, in general, through general interfaces, do they work with one another. So this is what we call the customizable algorithm problem. Uh, and some people also call it the fallback problem, right? Like you check if you've got a most a, a specialized algorithm and otherwise you fall back to the general algorithm and you might want to do that in several so you want to try an even less specialized one and an even less specialized one, and then basically settle on the most specialized one that works for your use case. Um, there's another aspect that nouns are composed of other nouns. Um, and this leads us to another problem. So as an example, a truck has an engine. Starting a car is pretty much starting the engine. Uh, washing a car is definitely not the same as washing the engine, right? Um, and so this is sort of the delegation problem. If we want to delegate start and stop to the engine and set throttle, right? All of these things go to the engine, but wash a car needs to implement. Um, and a car's engine can be swapped out. So a car might actually need to be generic to somewhat on the engine that it supports. Some nouns also just adapt other nouns, which is slightly different than uh, our delegation problem. Uh, this is the adaptation problem. Um, let's say we have a T and we want to make an audited T with a specific logger. And an audited T should be able to be used anywhere T is. That's kind of the whole point. And it has to have all the same properties and the same operations need to work on it and so on. Um, but this is kind of hard to do. Uh, and this is the decorator or the adaptation problem. Um, the point here is that if we are talking about customization points, any customization points defined on T must also be defined on audited T. Um, we also have the multiple dispatch problem because some verbs are transitive. Um, for instance, if you're charging a Lada from a petrol can and you want to charge a Tesla from a Tesla supercharger, you need to dispatch the, on the algorithm on both parameters, not just on the first one. And that's actually pretty difficult. Some customization point issues do not actually support this. Um, we also have the namespacing problem, which is that verbs mean different things in different contexts. Um, so let's consider the snippet of code. If we're uh, having Don Quixote charge of windmill, this clearly means that it's trying to attack it. And we all know this happened. This was a great story. Um, and of course, if you can make a great story with a human, you can also make it with a robot. So this also means attack. And if we want to charge a Tesla on a wind turbine, we should be able to do that, but that means fill up. And if we are slightly more modern, we can have Don Quixote charge a wind turbine because obviously there are no more windmills except museum pieces, right? Um, and we could also try to charge a robot Don Quixote on the solar cell. That means fill up because 
robots run on batteries, at least the good ones. However, now consider line six. What does charge of the robot Don Quixote on a wind turbine mean? Well, a wind turbine is a charger, but is also a valid target. So what does charge mean in this case? And the problem is most customization point schemes do not offer this namespacing uh, capability. So we have to pick one and the other one is unimplementable. And this is primarily what tag invoke solves. So to recap, which aspects are we talking about? The specialization problem is providing the basis operations. The detection problem is knowing that these basis operations exist before you try to use them and before you dispatch to the algorithm. The customizable algorithm problem is synthesizing the generic implementations of the operations and the fallback of algorithms. We want to be able to provide the specialization and use fallback. The delegation problem is that we want to forward uh, customization points to a sub-object. The adaptation problem is that we want to forward to a sub-object, possibly without knowing what they are ahead of time, and perhaps adapt what they do, um, which is slightly wider. Uh, we also have the multiple dispatch problem, which is the operation called can depend on more than one argument. And we have the namespacing problem, which is words mean different things to different libraries. Uh, we also have some desirable extra features that are not specifically about customization points. Uh, we want to be able to treat customization points as first class overload sets so that we can pass them to algorithms and then those algorithms can call them and we can pass overload sets as if they were a single thing. C++ doesn't have native support for this. You have to like use a Lambda or something. Um, we also find runtime dispatch desirable. Um, and on the other hand, we also want good inlining, which it, these two things are very much at odds. So having runtime dispatch when, when we need it and good inlining in all other cases is really desirable. Okay, so end of first section. Are there any questions? Um, I guess for shall I ask a trivial question here? Maybe I'm not that C++ expert. I come and go from C++ and Nimbra C like that. But all these problem uh, in like can these problems be uh, resolved using a combination of inheritance and polymorphism? You are literally guessing my next section. Okay, thanks. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Then proceed. We will go through that. Yeah, thanks. Any more questions? Everyone clear on the problem we're trying to solve? So we're trying to make a facility that is going to solve all of these problems. So that's kind of where we are. That's a cliffhanger. So, sorry, go on. That's a big cliffhanger. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, so let's let's go through history and see how this problem has tried to be solved. Like it's very closely related kind of to the polymorphism problem, but it's not quite the polymorphism problem because this is more about customization points than it is about uh, how we group functionality. But okay. So the first thing that came out of Smalltalk uh, and some other stuff before, but really mostly Smalltalk was object-oriented programming. Um, and this is how Smalltalk tried to solve this. And this is how, this is what C++ kind of inherited, right? In a slightly different way. And this is then what Java picked up and like uh, made it completely horrible OOP. Um, so, this is this is how 
object-oriented programming maps onto this problem that we've outlined. So customization points are virtual functions. Uh, capabilities are promised and delivered by name of base class usually, so of interface. Uh, and this basically represents a nominal typing system. So let's run through these aspects and see how OOP deals with each one of them. This is basically like get warm up. So you, I'm, I'm showing you something that you should already know kind of, you should be familiar with these things and just to see how all of these aspects work. Okay, so we've got our animal that it's a pure virtual interface and it has it's got one virtual function called say it returns void and so it's supposed to just make the animal say its name or its sound or whatever. Then we've got two implementations of animal. Their say methods do like va and moo into an o stream uh, and you see a nice override there. So, you know, that's um, and we've got an opossum which also implements say, but doesn't override it because we didn't inherit. And so here we've got our operator O stream, like the stream out operator that takes an animal by const reference and says the animal say into a stream, right? And so if we look at the main, in the first line of main, a sheep says ba just fine. And if we try to do the same with an opossum, it won't work even though the opossum does the right thing because we didn't promise the interface by name, right? We didn't say an opossum is an animal even though it can quack like one effectively. Um, so this is why the detection problem in OOP is solved by requiring that our parameter is an animal, that it implements an animal interface by name, and we're not actually detecting the capability through detecting the capability. We're just saying, well, if you, if you say you're an animal, we're just going to trust you. Um, OOP, the specialization problem, is obviously solved by providing the implementation. And I'm highlighting the wrong piece of code. Sorry, I should be highlighting the second thing, like the sheep it actually like implements the same method, right? It overrides it. Um, so that's how specialization works. Um, the customizable algorithm problem, um, instead of providing a pure virtual, you override the implementation in the base class, right? So Sir Wooly here is a sheep, but it's fancier. So it says Bah, lady when we try to print it out. Um, and it overrides, right? So sheep in this case is a slightly more general algorithm and animal doesn't even have an implementation, right? So here we clearly have hierarchies of generality that are implementable. Delegation, um, in OOP unfortunately is coupled with the types public interface, which is a really big problem. Um, so if it makes sense to inherit from the delegate, uh, it's easy to model delegation in OOP. You just don't override the base class implementation. And here we have a black Angus cow that doesn't over override the same method, but everything still works, right? Um, however, if you can't inherit from your delegate, which happens a lot because a car is not its engine, then it's a lot of manual work. Like a car's interface is a superset of the engine's interface, but we need to forward every method call manually. And that's really, really annoying, right? Um, so there's it's just a lot of work. Um, adaptation is in the same vein, all manual. Um, I wanna introduce this example, even though you probably already understand it. Um, let's say we have an optional car. Uh, this is sort of like std optional that only stores cars and forwards some of its public interface. So it wraps a concrete car. It also inherits from car, if you see, and it implements all of the start, stop, set throttle, get throttle methods that are all overrides. And what it does is this monadic forwarding in each method, because if you see like start, it first checks if it has a car in its optional. And if it does, then it calls car start and so for everything else. But unfortunately, get throttle is unimplementable 
because get throttle, if you don't have a car, you don't have a value, which means that you're returning an optional int and you just can't override that method because it's not in the base class. Um, you, the base class obviously returns an int. Uh, so unfortunately, adaptation, like sometimes it's implementable, but a lot of work, like we see because it's all manual, sometimes it's not even implementable in OOP. So that's a really big problem with OOP. Like it just doesn't allow us to model certain things. Um, Multiple dispatch in OOP is really, really, really hard. Uh, basically, it's all manual, and we've got several ways of doing it. We've got the visitor pattern, we've got dispatch tables, we've got switch statements, we've got like, it, but it's basically very many unsatisfactory answers. Like, if you really, really need to do it, you can do it, but it's like really annoying. Um, namespacing is an unsolvable problem in OOP. Um, all member functions are always in the same namespace, and we cannot solve the robot Don Quixote charge to wind turbine problem, right? Like, does this mean attack or replenish batteries? Who knows? Uh, because we literally have to choose one. We cannot dispatch by type. Um, so, what we end up doing in OOP is we end up naming this method like uh, fill up and the other one we uh, name attack or whatever and hope that it won't clash somewhere else. And like you have, if you wanna combine different class hierarchies, it's really difficult because nobody thought that they would be combined ever and it's like a really big problem. So OOP doesn't really scale in this way. Okay, we're at the end of OOP. What are the questions? So, hi. Um, hi, Roy. On this last slide, um, if the robot Don Quixote does a multiple inheritance and inherits from both, uh, I guess, uh, uh, like something that attacks and something that uh, gets filled up, uh, can those both have uh, charge methods and be like Im implemented uh, uh, you know, separately, assuming that there are different arguments to each of them? Well, the problem is the, they have the same argument, the wind turbine, oh. okay. right? And so they clash. Basically, like you're you're gonna get a, a name lookup error because well, it's, you, you either have to choose when you're defining your class by saying using or whatever, or during runtime by casting to the parent or something like that to, to resolve the ambiguities. But the problem is if you have if you're casting to the parent, you're saying, I want to call that implementation, you're, you still have no way of implementing both. Yeah, that's true. No, it's nasty anyway, either way. That's... Yeah, it's nasty and it's not just nasty because uh, you have to choose. I'm not saying there isn't a way to choose. The problem is both of these methods have the same signature and there's literally no way of doing both in the same class. Like implementing or specializing them. Yes. Like, uh, could you attempt to solve this by uh, using a uh, multiple decorator approach? There are many, very many ways that people have tried solving this, and they all suck. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like that's the problem. Like the minute you go, like the minute you want to shoehorn, like there's like the easiest way is just to name it differently, right? And like, if you want multiple decorators, then like you have to change the users to like do st stuff and, and it's like, it, you can't be generic. You have to know what you're doing. And the second you need to know what you're doing, you're no longer in this, we want to treat things uniformly world. Yeah, I also remember the Descent patterns and the head first descent patterns text where it is mentioned like coffee with different decorators or something like that. So I'm also, I also agree. Yeah, same. Yeah, like there's just no way of doing it. Uh, like, yes, there are workarounds. Like, the problem is those workarounds don't work in general, they work in the specific. And the whole point is to have a general solution. Yeah. That's that's kind of the the issue, right? So we we want something better. 
Um, any more questions? I, I just had a comment, like a very minor comment that sure. I, I agree with you and, and, and it's ugly. And I think maybe in some cases, like the optional link, I think you could like call the int and then call the optional and see if it, it, in some condition return whatever int or something to the, to the, to the function that calls. But in general, I agree with you that this is ugly. So it, it just, yeah. some, some, as you said, some workarounds can be done, but, but I agree that it's not, it's, it's, yeah. so, it's controversial so, to the, to the structure in a way. Yeah. And so I, I saw that in the chat, there was a question of why not just cast to the parents type that you mean? And the problem is if you're doing the cast, you're gonna get the base types implementation where you want to specialize it in Robo Don Quixote. And like, you're basically, again, shooting yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. right, but so I that, that, refer to the optional uh, specifically, that's- uh, Sorry, uh, I, I don't really understand what, the, what your oh. optional comment is. Oh, I thought maybe, uh, maybe I, I, no, maybe I got it wrong. Wait, I haven't looked at it enough, but you could call get uh, spiritual um, and implement in here, your own function calls the optional override. And if it doesn't do what you want, you just return like any other in like. Yeah, 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 you can turn it in. Not, okay, okay, so here's, here's, here's yeah. how I understand this. So you're basically saying, um, we could say that in the optional car case, like we could return minus one for the throttle and that's like yeah. an invalid value. And exactly. we've made, we've made an, uh, uh, what's called a maybe monad out of an int. Yeah. At that point, you are no longer type safe. Like you yeah, don't want to do that. Like, I agree. Uh, optional implementations that don't use like an additional. The, the the moment you have special values, then you can implement optional with just a single, a single type. So, yeah. but still, you had to think about that before you implement. You just return the regular int. Yeah. And if, so, so. if every value is a valid value, then you, that single one value, special value, doesn't exist. Well, the issue is also that algorithms that work on cars are just going to call that get throttle and then expect that the return value is in the range that of documented values, right? And suddenly this class doesn't actually do that. So you're breaking invariants that you can't detect. Yeah. And also that, it, that it's ugly. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not okay. Like, don't do that. <laughs> okay. So because of all of these unsatisfactory answers, um, the next method that people came up with was class template specialization. Um, and this particular approach to customization points uh, maps to our problems in the ways we'll go for. But basically capabilities are provided by specializing traits classes and this is mostly a nominal typing approach, but it has some structural typing support. So we'll, we'll see how that works. Uh, so basically the basic mechanism is to override the call operator or some other thing for like type traits and so on, on a customization point structure. And the most basic example is like std hash, std less. Uh, we've got iterator traits for iterator that you're supposed to, you know, fill out and you get a default that like picks out the iterator traits from your iterator if you define them in there and so on. Um, and then we've also got tuple size and tuple element and so to get that you can specialize for your type um, and things will like magically work. Um, so specialization, how does it work? Uh, it's verbose and it's completely manual and it works like this. So basically, let's say we have a class Mokush. Mokush is a old Slavic goddess of spring and uh, I guess like life kind of um, and waters. 
Um, and it has some benevolence and it bestows to you a boon, right? That is templated. Um, and, though, and then if you want to hash a mokash, you need to close namespace spring and then partially specialize hash, define your operator parens uh, such that it takes a mokash uh, and returns the size t because that's the, that's the contract. Uh, and then you use some kind of a hash combiner to combine your benevolence and a hash of your boon. Um, but basically the problem is you got to close your namespace. You got to open the customization points namespace and put the customization point in there and then reopen your namespace to implement the rest of your library. And then you need to teach partial class template specialization to people so that they can review your code because we all do that, right? So teaching partial class template specialization is kind of hard as I've noticed. I don't like doing this. This is very annoying. Um, Specialization number two, like how do you define your own customization point? Because right now we've just defined a specialization for a customization point. Now we're going to define our own, like we're defining std hash, uh, except we're being nice about it as opposed to std hash. So let's say we're defining the same customization point as before, but differently, like we're going to call it stay. Um, and we want to diagnose if you don't have an explicit specialization. So we're not gonna make a default implementation of this. And then we're gonna provide a dispatcher because we see that we defaulted it to void here. We're gonna provide like the default, if you didn't specify a type dispatcher, uh, that's basically gonna just figure out what T is and then forward to the correct say function. And then we're going to define our struct sheep just so that we have something that's going to compile. Um, and we're going to specialize our say for the sheep. Uh, and we're going to make our operator parens and we're going to have it take an O stream and a sheep and we're going to say ba and that's it. And then we can call it from a main like this. So we just make a say and we call it with C output and sheep. And this is not like super objectionable. The problem is just that this is like insanely verbose and in a name, like you have to do it in a foreign namespace that like isn't yours. So you shouldn't be opening it in the first place. And it's like kind of icky, but otherwise it's actually, it's actually pretty clean. Uh, like, like conceptually it's really clean. Code wise, it's really, really ugly. Um, so detection, it mostly works by name. Like you, you see if you've got a specialization under that type, and if you do, then everything's fine. Otherwise it doesn't compile and like your decal type will tell you that. Um, and we can also detect by structure, by nested type depths, like we've, we've got like iterator traits and stuff and that just works. So detection is actually pretty nice. Um, we also can solve the customizable algorithm problem in a very similar way. Like this is a slightly extended example of say, um, instead of uh, not defining the base template to provide checking, we basically just implement the base template and I forgot a semicolon on line seven. Uh, we implement the base template uh, with like the default algorithm that just prints the class name. I mean, it's not good, but like it'll do. Right, if, if we want this to be more universal of an operation. Um, and in this case, uh, we also can do explicit defaulting for an algorithm uh, so that if we have a sheep uh, and Albert is a sheep, we can say, well, say of Albert is the same as say of sheep, but just using inheritance and it just works, it's fine. Um, so delegation and adaptation in this, format are always manual and explicit for every customization point and it gets really verbose. And this is one other thing that we don't really like. So std hash for optional, you can define it. Um, and in this case, like we check whether M has a value and otherwise we return 42. Um, um, and I actually think that I swapped those around. Yeah, I did. That, that should read m dot empty, and then this is correct. Uh, otherwise, we just 
cache the value. All right, uh, multiple dispatch works perfectly. Uh, template specializations have built-in partial ordering, just like over overload resolution, like it, it's great. Um, namespacing, they are perfectly namespaced. So here we can define our customization point charge, both in namespace power and in namespace battle. And then when we wanna call one, we call power charge. And in the other case, we call battle charge and we can define both and this is like perfect. Right, so namespacing is stalled. Wonderful, except for the fact that everything else is horrible. <laughs> uh, so questions about uh, class template specialization approach. I think Ronan had a question in the chat. Uh, you can, if you want to ask it by like some. Uh, it yeah, just please add a comment about the, one of the previous slides, you use a chip and not the one uh, back, one or two more. Uh, yes, here we have the next one. Uh, you flew past it. Uh, oh, this one? Uh, yes. Uh, would ship uh, override the, the T const uh, reference? Uh, yeah, you could pass it with constref. Uh, the thing is, sheep right now is a stateless class, so it doesn't matter. Okay, it will be okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't very careful about the constrefs and stuff like that. This is very much slideware. Um, like I was careful with the constrefs in the generic cases, but here in the specific case um, of sheep on line uh, twenty. Like sheep doesn't have state. It's actually faster to pass it by value. Okay, I was I was just trying to think if this is a proper uh, replacement or uh, specialization of the original. Yeah, it's it's the correct specialization for a nil sized class. Otherwise, I'd probably be passing it by construct. Uh, the thing is, we're not doing any kind of overriding here, right? Like we're basically picking an implementation at compile time based on the types, but we're not doing the an actual override. Yeah, yeah, so... yeah, we're not doing an override. Definitely not. This is this is how we select an implementation using class template specialization. Okay. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. no, no, don't don't apologize. Like. If you missed it, probably five other people did, people did too, right? Like, it's not, <laughs> um, yeah, this is very normal. Um, any more Thank questions? You, yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you explain the difference between the default implementation and default forwarder? Didn't ah, yes. Um, so the default forwarder, oh, actually we've got all of them here, right? The, the default forwarder is the same on line nine to 14. Okay. So consider, okay, actually I need the main to explain this. So consider this line 21. Um, so my libs say, you see that I'm calling it without any template parameters or template arguments. Like I don't even mention the, the angly bracket. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna use class template argument deduction and it's gonna go to the base template of struct say and it's gonna see that there's a default argument on say. And it's gonna say, well, the default argument is void. I have all of the uh, of the class template arguments ready, I'm gonna now instantiate this template. And then it instantiates say of void because T was defaulted to void. And say of void does have an, in, an instantiation in this one, right? So then it calls this function with the two arguments we've provided, C out and sheep. And then this deduces T, right? in the template type named T on line six, this reduces it and puts it into say again. Now this T was deduced to sheep. Sheep has a specialization. We go to this particular template. We then call its operator parens because this is what line eight is doing. And then finally print bar. 
So that's how the whole, that's how this example works. So let's go to the second example now where we've got a default implementation. It works exactly the same way if we had the same name because we never actually looked into the body that is lines four through six of struct say. We only looked at its signature to figure out the void. However, if once we get to say a void, T is deduced to something that doesn't have a specialization, such as a possum. We won't find a specialization for a possum because we haven't defined it. So the default specialization here on line four to six will actually come into play and we'll call this operator paren. So line, line 12 will, will call the line, line 12 four. will call line four instead of line 20. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and in the previous case, if we tried a possum and we didn't have this in instantiate, sorry, it, we didn't have the default definition of say, we would get a compile time error. Like a possum doesn't have a, a specialization of say. That's the difference. Thanks. I have uh, so two questions, I guess. One specifically for this thing, um, will uh, uh, deduction guides work as well? As, as a way to tell uh, the compiler uh, how, to, how to generate uh, the correct uh, object? Um, we are using deduction guides here um, in, um, well, so, the 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 correct answer here is no they won't um let me let me go to the right uh i need to go to the main right here so you you see line 21 you see the curlies after say that is the only thing that impacts ctad and by that uh invokes um, the deduction guide, right? So the actual braces, like the function call of C out and sheep doesn't impact deduction guides at all because we're actually dispatching it to the class instance that the curlies are creating. So if you put something into the curlies, then sure, you'd, you'd get like deduction guide things and then you'd select the correct thing um, just like we're actually doing, like we're using implicit deduction guides with no template parameters because we've got one default one. And that's what, I, what we're actually doing. We're using a, an implicit deduction guide. Fair enough? Yeah. And then the second thing, uh, um, in this example here, you don't really use uh, anything related to concepts or uh, enable if, etc. but technically uh, you could, or people use those things to even, you know, get get into more, uh, I guess, uh, complicated. We're or... gonna get there. Uh, okay. Concepts don't really. I mean, concepts do have subsumption behavior and stuff like that. So yes, we could use concepts with like CTS, but I've never seen them used with CTS. Okay. Um, it like subsumption behavior with class template specializations is really. Like it's not weird because it's mathematically correct, but it like it's it's very strange when you try to actually program with it. Like people don't know how to read that code. However, like we're we've got three more approaches to cover. So okay. now we've got a slight aside to argument dependent lookup because you need to understand it to understand the other three approaches. Um so ADL, for people who are not first in it, um, means that in C++, if you call a function without qualifying it, such as our call to compare on line three, um, then the possible candidates for the compare function, this is overload set construction, right, um, are all functions named compare in. 
the function scope if we put them in through using declaration. Namespace O because that's where F is. Global namespace, which is parent of O, so the entire chain of namespaces of F. Namespace P because A is in P. And namespace R because B is in R. Uh, and there are a few more. If A and B have any template arguments, then their immediate enclosing namespaces are also uh, searched for functions named compare. All of their bases namespaces are searched for compare. And this set of namespaces is called the set of associated namespaces of a type and of a function. So this works really great for um for uh operators yeah works really great for operators and and stuff but it doesn't work very well for everything else uh but we'll get to that so any questions on this slide specifically everybody understand what argument dependent lookup is wonderful all right, way better than I expected. All right, so the first ADL-based um, uh, customization point design is just plain old ADL. Uh, we're gonna call that POA. It basically is just unqualified function calls and sometimes we add the ADL two-step, which we will explain. So we've already probably mostly seen this too. Uh, so if you remember, we were we had our stream out operator here, um, and yeah, the the basic way this works is you define your operator, which is in this case our customization point, in an associated namespace for your type, such as you know um, next to it or as an uh, as a hidden friend. And then you use it unqualified. Just like we do here, it's not in the same namespace, but uh, it will be found and it'll just work. And here's where we use concepts also that were mentioned. So you see that animal on line three is a concept that requires the class to have a same method. This is how we do detection, right? Um, and if you are an animal, this operator stream out will apply to you and it will be found and called. So how does specialization work? Okay, so a common technique to specialize is to use a hidden friend to define customization point implementation, such as swap. We like, we, like we've all done this. So we've got a car, and we're defining swap, and we're got, we're generic on the engine, um, and so we never want to swap the object ID because it's the object idea, we just might, might want to swap out the engines. Like, don't do this, this is an example. Um, and what we really need to do is we want to just delegate to the standard library swap if engine doesn't have its own swap. Otherwise, we want to use the engine swap. So this is what's called the ADL two-step, which is we bring the default implementation in using using, and then we call it unqualified so that we pick up the most specialized version of swap for our type. And this two step to bring in the default implementation, which just uses three moves, is really, really problematic. Like number one, it's problematic to teach. Number two, it is two statements, which poses problems. Um, mainly because we cannot do any kind of detection with it, but we'll get to that. So if we want, in plain old ADL, if we want detection, we can define an animal, this is like a third example of animal already. Um, let's say we want a free function say that streams out our, um, our you know, say, uh, and then we implement the concept, like we've, define this as a hidden friend because that's actually the best way to do ADL customization point. Uh, it's fastest. And then we can use it in this kind of an operator stream out that streams out animals. 
Like we can use it and just call it unqualified and this is all good and well. Uh, we don't need the two-step because our operators stream out and our classes are in the same namespace, which is nice. So if all of that is true, POA kind of sort of works. Now the problem is this detection thing because you cannot do using and concept check um, because this is an error. And so really the only way to, de to define the swappable concept is if you're already in namespace std because std swap is there. If you don't open namespace std, you cannot define the swappable concept, which is insanely infuriating. Um, customizable algorithm, well, we're using overload resolution, right? Uh, as we saw, getting the default implementation often requires the two-step, which is annoying. Um, so we've talked about this. The swap is the default implementation for swap. Picking it up requires a two-step, and it will be used unless the type provides a better match, and I have typos. Um, so the Sir Woolley example um, is that uh, it is nice that we can pick up the base classes implementation of a generic algorithm uh, and override the basis functions uh, still through inheritance. This works really nicely. Um, so Sir Woolley in X4 inherits from X3 sheep where we defined our you know stream out operators and stuff like that, and it does define its own say, but it picks up operator stream out from X3 because bases are included. So this is really nice. Uh, this this works pretty pretty nicely. Um, we can also do concept based optimization with this. Uh, advance is a very obvious example. It's an algorithm that's in the standard library and it just advances an iterator. So if you've got an input iterator, you have to do the whole while loop and just, you know, increment it as many times as the div, uh, as n says. Um, if you've got a random access iterator, you can just do plus equals because plus equals is a basis function for random access iterators, but not for input iterators. However, let's say you have your own block iterator that's like fancy and block iterator is not a concept in the standard library, right? Um, it's not a random access iterator because you still need to like do linear search on blocks, but within a block, you've got random access. So you can do stuff like this. Um, while n is larger than block size, we jump to the next block uh, and we sub subtract, and then in the last block, we just do the regular input iterator style advance, right? Sorry, uh, we can forward through blocks, but within blocks, we also just have linear access apparently. Okay, uh, but whatever works for your particular iterator, right? And this is actually pretty great because you're always gonna get the best implementation for your type. This is what ADL is made for, it's wonderful. Um, so in summary, like we've actually done pretty good. Like defining the specialization was, was really simple. We just defined them in the type and it was fine. And like everything was picked up like we wanted and overload resolution is awesome. So we always picked up the best one. Um, so the only problem we really ran into was the default implementations which require a two step. And so this breaks the detection problem. Um, and there's uh, let's evaluate it on the other aspects. So delegation uh, kind of also requires a lot of manual work if you can't inherit. Like we saw that if you can inherit, then delegation was pretty easy. But again, in this LADA example, we have to delegate every customization point by hand. And that's just basically like, it's no work if you can afford to inherit. If you can't afford to inherit, it is just all manual. Um, and why is it two autos? Sorry? Why does it say auto, auto? Oh, um, I think that's a typo. Okay. I thought uh, it's a feature. Thank you. I, I think that's literally a Vim problem, and I didn't notice it. <laughs> I probably pressed two when I was entering it, and then just, I don't know. Weird. Thank you for 
I will fix it in the next version of the slides. All right, adaptation, um, yeah? Sorry, uh, shall I ask it out here? Or, I mean, most of the things uh, in class, uh, class specialized, class template specialized in concept, I won't understand much. But still, I remember one thing I read in a CPP code guideline. It's like, it is not like, uh, is the front functions recommended? Uh, I mean, ah, that's what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, so, CPP core guidelines say that friend functions are not the best idea, right? Like, because they imply coupling. This is very different. Okay, okay. This is what's called a hidden friend, and it is a very good idea. Notice that this swap function is not defined anywhere outside of the class. It is not declared outside of the class. It is literally implemented inside of the class which means that it is part of the class's public interface. It is the exact same thing as a member function. Okay, then what would be the difference between a member function and a hidden front? The way you call them. A member function you call with object dot member function name. This you call with the free function syntax. And it behaves like a free function. And by that, I mean um, the Parameters to this function for the purposes of dispatch are treated as equal because in a member function case, the first parameter is treated, especially the first parameter being this. Um, and so uh, object dot member function will only ever select between the member functions of that object. And this will properly do dispatch. So basically mem member functions do not do multiple dispatch correctly. Uh, hidden friends do dispatch correctly and work with ADL correctly, and yet they're tightly coupled with the class. That's kind of the point. So that's why it's okay that they're friends, because they're part of the class's public interface. Like, I, I'm serious. This is like very, this is considered kosher and like amazing. Like, you, you should do hidden friends all the time, and I do them all the time, and it's not a coupling problem. Okay, got it. So uh, rather than the uh, normal front functions, the advantage would be? Uh, what's I don't advantage? remember when I last needed a normal front function. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is in C++ not 3. Yeah, maybe. Uh, okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Okay, so hidden friends for, a, for ADL purposes, wonderful. Because by the way, hidden friends are not callable in any way other through ADL. You cannot call a hidden friend by name. I mean, by, by, uh, by um, its full name. Like you cannot say namespace colon colon swap and get this function. It will never work. You can only call it through ADL. And that's why hidden friends are fine. In fact, they speed up compiles and they improve uh, all kinds of module based things like I, I don't want to get into it. We don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, but yeah, hidden friends are great. You use them for everything. Uh, where were we? Okay, thank uh, you. Right. We were still at specialization, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah, okay. So as far as detection, oh no, we went through detection. Um, customize, I, yeah, okay, yeah. We've been through the Sir Wooly example, yes. Um, we've been through customizable algorithm. Uh, I think. Right. We, we didn't get here. Okay, delegation is a lot of manual work uh, and we discovered the typo in auto auto. Um, adaptation, right, we, we ended at adaptation. So this is basically the same example as the optional car before, except now these things are free functions, right? Instead of x dot start, we're calling start of star x of car um, by ADL, right? Um, 
And in this case, because we're not overriding anything, get throttle can totally just return an optional, and that's like totally fine. Um, so well, it, it all it's works. Fine, it's fine if your algorithm, if your generic algorithm is ready for a different type there. Yes, it is fine if your generic algorithm is ready for a different type there, which is why we all want monadic optionals. <laughs> um, but if your algorithm is not ready for a different type, at least it will fail to compile as opposed to you silently introducing a, a negative number to your throttle output, right? Mm. Yeah, but I think it's the apples and oranges. I think it's-, it's Yeah, not. sure, sure. I see where you're going with this. Like the, the point is here, we're really lifting it into a category of like we're, we're transitioning monads from a simple monad to a maybe monad lift, right? So we get interesting things. Uh, sorry, uh, what uh, prevented us from uh, uh, defining a throttle to return optional uh, before optional int? Uh, the reason was because we were using uh, uh, virtual functions, and that meant that overriding means that you have to return the same type, and here we don't have to. Ah, okay. Well, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Because the calling convention is different, right? Like. Customization points always have to be understood in, ter in terms of being the link between the object and the consumer of that object. Um, and so the calling convention is really important when you're talking about customization points, because you have to consider both how you use them and how they're implemented. This is why they're so hard, right? Like if we're all using just concrete things, then nobody cares. The point here is really to make generic interfaces so that algorithms written to a, to an abstract concept can work with an abstract model. Um, and here we're saying, well, if an algorithm can deal with optional cars, then it'll just deal with optional cars and we have a way to model that. And, on, and in OOP, we don't have a way to model that. Multiple dispatches, perfect. Function overloading and partial ordering just work. Wonderful. Um, namespacing, this is the real problem. Because all of these customization points are called unqualified, right? And so uh, that means that all ADL customization points are globally reserved names. And this is fine for operators because they're only ever called unqualified. And if you're calling them qualified, you're evil and don't do that. Um, and super duper general things like begin and swap and stuff that like we kind of know those are reserved. We won't make them mean two different things because we know. Uh, but it's really not fine. Uh, when the standard library wants to reserve more names because people might have already used them. And at that point, we're basically taking a name that people are using and making it, you know, ours. Because now it's globally reserved because it means one thing and one thing only. Um, and third party libraries virtually cannot reserve names for the same reason, because that means that they don't work with other third party libraries that they don't know about. Um, so this is a slide of all globally reserved names because they're customization points in the standard. And you can see that there's quite a lot of them. There's swap, there's begin, there's end, and there are member function uh, analogs. So yeah, we went even further here. We said, not only is the free function begin a customization point, if you define a member, it's also a customization point. So like you can never have a member that's any, that means anything but the begin of the range if you've got a begin. And same for C begin and C end and R begin and R end and those. Size and S size, same thing. Empty, same thing. Data and C data, same thing. Uh, strong, weak and partial order, iter swap, iter move, and operators stream out 
um, and basically all of the other operators and conversion functions. All of these names mean what they mean and nothing else. And you, like, if you're using them for other things, you are inviting breakage. And that's not nice. Um, yeah. No, I just said, I, I just had a thought of imagine how it would be like to have numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not, but you know. <laughs> right. So uh, what about extras of this approach? Well, extending is really easy to teach because we all understand how overloading works. Um, and it's absolutely fantastic for operators. Like, we love that. Um, so any questions on plain old ADL customization points? Yeah, uh, can you return the, the slide where you tried to define the concept uh, swappable? Swappable, swappable, yes. Uh, so what if you uh, define it in uh, namespace detail and move the using there? Won't it work? And then use from use detail uh, swappable in the upper namespace. You know what? It might. Um, yeah, that might work. I'd have to try. It might actually work because it's an associated namespace and then I don't, uh, usings are, yeah, I think usings are in fact search and searched for in your enclosing namespace. It might actually work. All right, good idea. We should try it. But it's still really annoying because you need detailed namespace. Like it's not nice. Um, any or, other way, questions? Can you, also, can you also do like an or can you, you have like a requires like two requires clauses, either of calling S swap or STD swap instead of using or. Um, you need to differentiate between them because stud swap has certain. Uh, stud swap has dependencies, right? You need to be movable to use stud swap, and some classes are not movable but are still swappable. Okay. Uh, so like, it's really difficult to craft your fancy thing to do exactly what it's supposed to because you need to literally recreate the swap um, contract, like the stud swap contract. You just need to do it manually and that's just like why. All right, uh, let's talk about Nibloids because they're really cool. Um, so Nibloids, said, well, this two-step is really annoying. Let's not do that. Uh, and also, we want to pass these as first-class objects around. So let's, let's kind of do this. So Nibloids inherit all of the good parts of plain old ADL customization points. So we'll just cover the differences. I don't want to like explain everything again. Um, not all Nibloids in the standard library are customization points. Uh, some Nibloids are just function objects and not custom customization points because they do not they do not reserve a global name. All right. Uh, so with Nibloids, there's no more two step. Uh, we use them fully qualified, uh, such as stud ranges swap, and stud ranges swap does the two step for you internally, so you don't have to do that. And that's much better. Uh, and that's actually true of all stud ranges customization points and also of uh, weak, strong, and partial order uh, customization points. Basically, every new customization point that is here from C17 and 20 is a CPO. Um, for instance, we, we also get really nice fallback behavior because we get a we kind of get a dispatch function where we can go wild. So for instance, with Nibloids, we can have stuff that's crazy like this, like 
for instance, strong order, the way it's defined is if the decay type of the expressions E and F differ, it's ill-formed. Uh, otherwise, strong ordering, sorry, otherwise, if this expression, so if I can initialize strong ordering from the expression strong order of E, F, um, if I can do this with overload resolution performed in a context that doesn't define this CPO, um, then it's that. Sorry, this is standard ease. It's hard to read. Um, otherwise, if E is a floating point type, we actually get an IEEE floating point strong total order defined in the IEC 559 standard, which is really, really great. So we finally have a way to you know, differentiate NANs in the standard. So that's a really cool thing. <laughs> Use strong order if you can. Um, otherwise, strong ordering uh, of the spaceship operator, if it's a well-formed expression. Um, and otherwise, it's ill-formed, but still CNA friendly. So you can detect whether you have a strong ordering. So this is like a crazy set of prescriptions to program in the previous world where we only had overload sets. Um, so with Nebloids, this is how you do it. Um, well, we'll see how you do it a little later. Um, uh, we also get the fact that CPOs are first-class overload sets with Nebloids. Uh, so let's say we've got a vector what of CPOs? vectors. What's, what's the acronym? Oh, CPO? Uh, CPO is customization point object. OK. A Nebloid and CPO are roughly interchangeable. Uh, customization point objects are Nebloids that reserve a global name. That's, that's the only difference. So, okay. yeah. So let's say we've got a vector of vectors of floats, um, or doubles in this case. Um, and we want to copy all of the empty ones. And that, I mean, we can totally do that. Um, you just pass the range as empty. It is an actual function object. And it, like, copy if will just call it on whatever you pass it. So you're basically passing the entire overload set. You don't need to select anything. And that's really nice. Um, the other really nice thing is that because they represent the entire overload set and the overload set that they represent is like location agnostic, they will represent the same overload set no matter where you call them from. So when you're calling a CPO, you're always going to get a consistent set of implementations, which is not true for plain old ADL because what you get there is really dependent on where you're calling it from because the overload set is going to differ. OK. Um, remaining issues. Uh, they still don't solve the namespace problem uh, because they still call a customization point with the same name. Uh, they still take up that global name. Um, so as a result, they must still be rare and universal. But at least we got rid of the two steps. So here's how one implements an Ebloid. Um, so let's say we've got a namespace lib. That's our library. And we want to implement the like our own swap Nebloid. We're going to make a struct called swap fn, and we're going to make it final for various performance reasons. Um, you can ask about that at the end if we've got time. Uh, we're going to say that we want t to be swappable, uh, and we are going to take t, x, and t, y, and we're going to forward no accept. And we're going to do the two step, which is using std swap, and then we're going to call the swap. So that's basically how std ranges swap is implemented. Um, now, this swap fn uh, relies on these two concepts that are defined in std uh, that you know rely on the fact that std swap is already in scope. Uh, and yes, we might be able to get away with like using in a, a utility namespace. 
Um, and then we need to put this swap fn as an object into an inline namespace swap definition and then make an inline const x per swap object. Now, the reason you need to do that is because unless you do this, you're going to get the error that is here on line five. Um, so when you try to define your own swap function in your library, you're going to get an error. That swap is already declared as a different kind of symbol. Of course, it's declared as a different kind of symbol. It's an object, not a function. Um, and those can't be in the same namespace. So we need to define it in an inline namespace and then export its name into the closing namespace, and then it's fine. Yeah, I know it's a hack, but it works. Uh, the reason we need it to be inline const expert uh, is because it needs weak linkage, because uh, you don't want swap to be an embedded like object in every translation, like in any translation unit. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, yeah. I created uh, like a global variable, const expert variable, inside the swap def uh, namespace, but it's also accessible as lib colon colon swap, and, and exactly. it has operator uh, parens that I can call as a function. It, it does the customization points. Yes, that is exactly what a nibloid is. Okay. So yeah, it's it's a combination of this type and this global variable that has the operator parens that forwards to the customization point. And because it's an object, it's, all, it's in a particular location, right? Uh, objects don't participate in, uh, in ADL. So you're never going to get the customization point object by ADL. You have to actually call it by name. Um, but it will forward to a consistent overload set. So that's kind of what nibloids are. Like they're not a very, yeah. No, go ahead, Roy. Uh, like they're not a very sophisticated approach, but it's really powerful when you extend it to tag invoke. Uh, they are so much better than plain old ADL, though, that the standard is now using this approach for every one of the new customization points. So, so strong order is implemented like this, and I will show you how that is done. Um, so yeah, Nibloids give us, uh, uh, are, are there any more questions before we go on? I just want to uh, clarify to make sure I understand. Basically, we're kind of replacing the function overload mechanism with an object, like a const expert object, empty object, which defines the operator, the function called operator. So we're getting something that looks like a function and that has the syntax of a function but isn't really a function and internally internally it would give you the the um, consistent uh overload resolution exactly okay. wow that is that is exactly what this is doing okay um so we get a slightly richer dis dispatch also, because the Nibloids operator parens is not an overload set, because it's the Nibloids operator parens, right? Um, so we can actually do some fanciness behind the curtain of that Nibloid. So this is how strong order is implemented. So we're implementing the strong order that we def talked about before. Like we've got five points that we need to implement. So the first point is that uh, E and F the expressions need to the, uh, decay to the same type. And this does that, right? Um, the second point is that if the strong ordering of strong order of E and F is a valid expression, which is what the concept on line two says, then we can enter this function and then we're going to hit the first if const expert uh, branch and we're going to call strong order on x and y and that's how we implement point number two point number three is implemented by checking whether this is an iec 559 type 
Um, and then we're going to hit the second if const expert block and call the intrinsic for floating point total order, right? The fourth point, which is if we've got a strong spaceship, is checked by the concept on lines six through eight. And then we're going to hit the third if const expert block. And then we're just going to return x spaceship y. And then otherwise, we static assert. Um, the fifth point, which is we need to forward no accept and we need to be CNA friendly, uh, is implemented by line 12. So we can actually check if it's a no accept strong order. This will actually CNA if it's not anything. And it will give us no if it's not no accept. And that's it. So this this is the entire implementation, uh, except for the implementation of is no except strong order, which looks very much like the two concepts above and the requires below. This is the entire implementation of that entire standard use paragraph. And good luck trying to do that with plain old ADL. Like you are not gonna get that. <laughs> um, so we can do fancy things with Nibloid. So you basically get uh, control over your all overload settings. You can define exactly. ordering on it and you can define fallbacks and, 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 you, and you're basically customizing your overload set. Yep. Nibloids are awesome. Oh. Which is why I mean we we're using them, but they're not the awesomest, and we'll get to that. So the recap for Nibloids. Specialization is great, which is because it's the same as plain old ADL. Uh detection, um, well, we still have the manual forwarding of Spina and no except, but everything else is fine. Customizable algorithm is way better than plain old ADL because, I mean, you saw, like, we could, we could if const expert our way to infinity. Um, delegation is still all manual. Adaptation is still all manual. Multiple dispatch is great. Uh, namespacing is still terrible because it's impossible. And uh, we get first class overload sets and no more two step as bonuses. Okay, so Nibloids were great. Any more questions on Nibloids before we go on to tag and vote? Um, I have a question about the link with, between this and ADL. Um, I've seen a proposal, must have been uh, by either Herb or Bjarne, that would have ADL fixed as in how it should have been in hindsight as in being more limited and uh, only working for, uh, I think, for operators and for the one intended and so on. If ADL was, were, were to be done in such a manner properly, how much of all this stuff would you still need to do? That's a good question. Um, that paper will never happen. <laughs> um, just so you know, like that is not a paper that's gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> That's a paper that was like, a, if I could have a pony kind of thing. Mm. Uh, no, you cannot have a pony. Uh, <laughs> this is C++, we like back. Not in C++ at least. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Really, yeah. control. You're basically, um, having, you're customizing your overload sets. This is much more powerful just than just plain old customization points. This is like customization point ordering and, and, and dispatching. Yeah and selection and yeah. However, notice that on line 17, we're still plain old ADLing strong order. Right, so yeah, we're, we're doing it from one place and only one, only one place. Exactly, we're doing it from only one place and the, the rest of it is fallback, right? So if we don't have a strong order defined for these two parameters, then we have one fallback, second fallback, and we literally synthesize it correctly every time and it's great, right? So yeah, you get ordering and you get complete control over fallbacks. And the, the good part of that question that came was, how much would you still have to do if, that, if we got that kind of ADL? And the answer is all of it. All of this you would still have to do. Because the problem really is that uh, the ADL paper that 
was referenced is solving mostly the namespace problem and not the overload resolution problem. So all of these things would still have to be done. However, the namespacing problem is solved, fortunately, by tag invoke. Um, so uh, are there any more questions before we go on? No, wonderful. All right. So here's the thing. Tag invoke is super cool because it's nebloids over nebloids. It's like <laughs> it's like nebloids on steroids. Okay. So here's the basic. Uh, so I, I should say this. Uh, tag invoke is not my work. It is the work of Eric Niebler, Kirk Schupp, and Lewis Baker. Niebler being the guy who nebloids in, are named for. So they they also came up with the previous implementation, and it just wasn't good enough. So they came up with this. Um, and you can use uh, tag invoke. It's in libunifex. I also have implemented, uh, re-implemented this from scratch for my uh, company. And we use it internally. Uh, it's awesome. I would really recommend you go and look at the implementation. It's really short, but it's kind of, uh, it, it, it is mind bendy at the first time you look at it. Okay. Uh, so tag invoke versus nebloids. Like, what do we want to do better? So nebloids are super verbose, uh, you saw. We should do better. Uh, nebloids take up global names and we must do better. This is like a really big must, right? And nebloids aren't decorated friendly and we need to do better. Well, what do you uh, mean when you say decorator? Uh, I mean the adaptation problem. They don't really solve it. You need to manually forward everything. I will have an example. Okay, so the key insight for tag invoke is that when defining a function, it's either a customization point or it isn't. There's no sometimes. Like there's no, in some cases, this function is meant to be a customization point and in others, it's just the regular function. Like that doesn't exist. If it exists, your design is bad and you should feel bad, right? Um, uh, so with this key insight, and thank you, Titus, um, we can make this choice. Like we can say, we're going to have one global name for customization point functions and everything else is not a customization point function. Uh, well, I mean, obviously other than the ones that we've already got defined and stuff. And this name is going to be tag invoke. With tag invoke, how do you define a customization point function? Well, it's still a nebloid, but kind of in easy mode. So we make it an inline const expert struct charge t final. I know that's quite a mouthful. Um, this is our type. And you can see that we're, uh, we are naming a charge on line nine, and I forgot to highlight that line and not line eight. Um, so we are going to define an operator parens, and we are going to correctly forward n no acceptness and uh, finability. These are line four is no acceptness. Line five is fine. And line seven is a call to tag invoke, which is the implementation of the tag invoke nebloid, which looks exactly like the nebloid you saw before. Like it's literally just a normal nebloid uh, that calls tag invoke uh, un, um, unqualified. So the change that we're gonna make is that as the first parameter to tag invoke, we're gonna pass ourselves, like the customization point object. And that is kind of mind bendy because like we're, we have our operator parens and like this is clearly what was called because we're in its body. And then we're calling tag invoke and we're passing ourselves as the first parameter. And then we're forwarding all the other arguments. So 
I would encourage you to define it with the name of the Nibloid or the, your customization point underscore T. Uh, so we've got charge on line nine and we've got charge T on line two. Uh, hold that. Um, and we still have to say the same line three times, like, you know, line seven and line five and line four are really, really similar. That's on purpose. You, I mean, this this is the famous line of uh, Vittorio Romeo. You have to say it three times. We still have to say it three times, unfortunately. The good part about saying it three times is that we have traits that do that for us, and we don't have to, you know, invent this every time. Um, for specialization, let's say we're specializing the two charges for our robot Don Quixote. We are going to make two hidden friends called tag invoke. The first one's going to take power charge T, and the second one's going to take battle charge T as its first parameter. And that is the dispatch. This is how you know which customization point you're specializing. That is it. This is now the name. And yeah, that's that's it. Uh, how do we do customizable algorithm? Well, you can provide a default implementation inside charge T. Uh, like, just just do that. Like, if we want to charge something, we just make a tag invoke. It takes a charge T, same as the other ones, and then we can say, well, if you've got you know, uh, if you can find a path from the actor to the target, then follow the path. Otherwise, you just shout a challenge and like you're embarrassed. So that's basically how charging works on mil on windmills, right? Um, and you still define your operator the same way you did before. Um, or alternatively, uh, you could do the whole live const expert cascade that we saw before inside operator parens. You can still do that, and you have all the power. Um, tag invoke is just for the part where you really want to do the ADL part. So ad, ad, uh, tag invoke will happily do that for you, and you can see whether the ADL part makes sense before you do because it's got proper spine and everything like that. Okay, um, and uh, Advised by Nibbler is prefer if context per cascade. Uh, delegation and adaptation. Uh, this is the optional example. And now we've got a proper optional, not, uh, not optional car anymore, because we can. And this is the real power here. So observe, like we're defining on line four, we're defining optional. It's got like the value and the has value and all that stuff and let's imagine it's got all of the appropriate constructors for CTAD to work and stuff and now we want to forward all customization points that are value support to the value well how are we going to do that well we're going to define tag invoke because we're obviously defining a customization point and then we're just going to take the CPO as a template parameter Remember, we get it as the first parameter. We, we're just going to template on it. And that we care to define is going to catch the tag invoke. Uh, and so then in the implementation of this, we're just going to see if we otherwise, we're just going to make an optional of we're just going to call this same customization point, that which is f, right, with the value, and forward the argument. So, this is like super magic. When I saw this for the first time, I was like, "What? You can do this? This is amazing." Um, and yeah, this literally forwards every customization point that T supports, optional of T will also support. And this is now a proper lift of T and all of its customization points to the maybe monad. Like it's fantastic. I like 
imagine what this does for variant. I mean, it's freaking crazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can meta program our adapters now. And you can do the same thing for that. Like this is delegation. You can do the same for adaptation because I mean, here we're really doing adaptation because we're returning an optional of whatever we are uh, calling. If you want to do delegation, you just, you know, call F on the value and you don't do the whole optional wrapping and that's just delegation. So yeah, we can do delegation and adaptation in one template function. It's perfect. Uh, any questions on this slide? Because I think this is like the coolest thing. I, I actually have a question. Do you have on line 14, do you still have a spina problem, if I'm not mistaken? Um, we you, we solved the spina problem on line 16. We basically say, mm -hmm. well, we're returning the decal type of optional of this F thing, right? So if that doesn't compile this function, Spina is out. Oh, yeah, yeah, I missed that. Thank you. So we're also properly forwarding Spina. So the only customization points that optional of T supports are the ones T support. And by the way, uh, at the risk of uh, going back to something you already spoke about, if uh, I want to do it with STD optional and, and, uh, and, and I don't have a, a way to insert a, a hidden friend, uh, would you just add tag invoke uh, outside of it or not? Uh, what would you do? Uh, what I would do for std optional, um, that's a really good question. Uh, you need to add it to a namespace that is always going to be there when optional is there because you're trying to forward all customization points that T supports, including the ones you don't know about that are in like completely different namespaces. Um, so really the correct thing here is to propose this for optional. Like you could add it to stud, which you know, you shouldn't do. Um, but other than that, you're kind of out of options of, of nice-ish solutions. Can I maybe write an adapter, like my own optional uh, class that just publicly inherits from STD optional and adds that, and uh, whoever wants to use tag invoke will just wrap their, their optionals with mine or something? Yes, you could totally do that. Okay. But but isn't it true that isn't it true that since this is this is like a universal construct? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like saying void. You know, it, there is only one tag invoke because it's like a global registry that you can control, right? So mm -hmm. there is no reason not to put this into the standard up to bike shedding the name, because hypothetically any any object that makes sense in the standard could do this because there's no reason somebody else w would want to make it differently because on a universal level we're all talking about exactly the same thing because it's a high level yep. abstraction there is design space here like if optional is not just the first parameter you might want to strip all optionals or just a few, right? Like th there's a multiple dispatch problem here. Um, or you might just want to strip the first optional and then recurse or something like that. I see. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure exactly what the correct implementation of the standard optional tagging mode forwarder is. I am pretty sure that it, if we get tag invoking the standard um, someone's going to propose it and that someone might be me or it might be, um, it might be, uh, Simon, uh, sorry, Cybrand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this, this is like, when I saw this, I was like, oh my God, this is the single handedly solves everything. Um, so yeah. Uh, uh, namespace thing, I already said we solve it. 
customization point objects are objects there in their own namespace. They don't clash. That's it. We can now implement this. Everything's fully namespaced. Um, so more namespacing takeaways, like for instance, archive serialized object is different from ODBC serialized object, right? Absol hash value, the ADL customization point doesn't need to be called ADL hash value anymore. It can just be Absol hash value. Uh, notice that the Absol hash value is not spelled with a namespace because ADL customization points are not namespace, right? Um, and this was really the big thing when I started using this. Uh, you don't have to think about name clashes anymore. Like literally you can just define 1500 customization points I mean, I'm exaggerating, but sure. Like for your library, just carry out, carry on defining customization points and just make your object is implement them and it's like all fine. You don't have to think, oh, I'm taking a global name. Oh my God, I have to be so careful. And like everything gets long and like, oh, you don't have to think. And this freedom to think made me far faster in getting to a good design because I was able to iterate. Because we all know naming is hard, right? And if you don't have to think about naming so hard, then things just get faster. Uh, multiple dispatches, perfect. Uh, extras, we get all of the extras that Niblo gave us. Um, but uh, for Tag Invoke, because we have this one name, uh, there's actually a way to lift it to runtime. Uh, like I know that Unifex has, uh, or I'm not sure if it's in Unifex, but I know that Baker has a type erasing wrapper for tag invoke where you can just list the customization points in the uh, argument list of your wrapper and it'll just lift all of those to runtime and you basically get a type erased wrapper for anything. <laughs> just by using these customization points, it's sick. Um, so basically you can lift any number of customization points instantly, which is amazing. Uh, um, sorry, uh, yeah? clarification. Uh, when I define this uh, thing, uh, I have some uh, uh, CFOs that uh, cannot be uh, actually called. Uh, for whatever reason, like uh, something, uh, this 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 will not this will not uh, not all uh, like uh, objects that uh, exist in my class uh, can be forwarded this way. Uh, but uh, if I understand correctly, if nobody ever tries to uh, invoke them through tag invoke. Uh, then uh, this will not uh, break my compilation, right? Of course. Um, however, if you try to lift it to runtime, then of course the, and you try to put one of those objects into this type erased wrapper that was generated, the dispatch happens right there and then, and it counts as if you were calling it even Absolutely. If nothing ever calls it, right? So Absol it's like, what, what's going to Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. so yes, it's just whether you're able to put one of those objects in that wrapper or not. So uh, when I, uh, but when, yeah, when, like, I, when I, when I, when I uh, uh, like design my class, I don't need to care that, oh, I cannot add this, uh, field or whatever, because it will clash with tag invoke. Uh, uh, it will be fine because nobody in their uh, like sane mind will uh, ever uh, try to uh, tag invoke this uh, field and uh, everything will be fine. Yes, I mean, you don't have to implement any customization points that don't make sense for your class. Right, like the whole point here is that you only implement the stuff that makes sense. And then if someone tries using something that doesn't make sense, then it doesn't compile. But if nobody tries using anything that doesn't make sense, then, you know, everything works. 
And I just, if I could just, to, but there is the overhead of compile time, just minor comment. Right? Oh, oh yes, I, I will, I will get to that. This is yeah. Smart. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I do. I have another question about the type yeah. erasure. Type erasure usually talks about methods and not about uh, free functions or things that look like free functions. So yeah. I don't I'm not, how do you interrogate an object method so that you can lift the entire thing into the... Um, well, it's actually fairly simple. Um, the core starts with you listing the function objects you want to lift in the template parameter list of your wrapper. So that's your enumeration of things you want to call, right? So then you do the Sean Parent style type erasure of tag invoke through like the hidden tag invoke method on the model wrapper. Okay, okay, okay. No, I thought you were saying that you can sort of get it automatically for all of your methods. And, uh, so there's no- No, you can get it automatically, you can get it automatically for a listed number of CPUs. Yeah, for, for a list that you name explicitly. Okay, okay. Which yeah, is and the benefit, that's what defines is... the public interface of your type erasure wrapper, right? Yeah. And because you did that, then you just get a list. Like it's it's free and it's amazing. And so uh, yeah, okay. Um, the guts are here. We've got a specification, and the only thing that in the spec is the tag invoke and the traits and unifex tag, which I don't want to talk about because we're late and I want more time for questions. Um, conventions. Do name the customization font type as CPO underscore T. You can use Unifex tag CPO to refer to the type of the CPO. I don't like it. Um, and do properly forward no accepts and do properly forward uh, Spine. Um, and that's about it. Uh, the issues for tag invoke, if you don't follow best practices, overload sets can get large because tag invoke is just one name. So do always use tag invoke through hidden friends. And that'll keep compile times really, really good, actually. Like you're only paying for two extra template instantiation contexts. However, um, there is this wonderful success story. So the LibUnifex authors report that when they use tag invoke, they were able to dramatically lower compile times in LibUnifex through the use of four men's deducing this through hidden friends. Because before they had uh, tag invoke, they had to manually define all the methods, all four methods, like the const ref and ref ref and uh, L value ref and const ref ref for every one of their methods. And when they transitioned to tag invoke, uh, that actually shortens to a single te uh, method uh, template, right? Which means that they cut down on overload resolution dramatically. Uh, and that overload resolution time, because they didn't have to disambiguate between four, but just one overload actually reduced the time to compile from 10 minutes to 10 seconds. So tag invoke, if done properly, can actually lower compile time. Right. Um, so this is my end. For generic interfaces, reach for tag invoke. And now I open for questions in general about everything.